I'm Shashanka, CEO of Acryl Data. Before this, spent a decade in data. Um, first half of my time at LinkedIn uh, was actually building a lot of data infrastructure, data pipelines, data platforms. I actually ended up fragmenting LinkedIn's data ecosystem. And then the next six years of my time at LinkedIn was actually atoning for all of my sins by putting all of these things together using Data Hub as a single kind of pane of glass on top of which people could do data discovery, data observability, and data governance. So that's been my story at LinkedIn, created problems and then solved problems. And now I'm doing the same with Data Hub for the rest of the industry. Yeah, and um, I'm Maggie. I am the community product manager for Data Hub. And prior to this, I've worked in everything from analytics engineering, BI engineering. Uh, I joke that I'm a recovering analytics engineer just because I have the, I know all the ways that things can go wrong. Um, so now I'm trying to atone for those, <laughs> those mistakes in my past. Um, so yeah, super excited to be here. Um, outside of work, I like to bake, I like to cook, I like to run. I have two beautiful dogs, Tucker and Marlo. If you come to office hours, I will show you photos. You have no choice. I'm also the proud parent of uh, three wild animals. Uh, one of them is a dog, uh, and the other two are humans. But uh, when they howl together, you can't actually tell the difference. So we have a lot of uh, shared love for long-tailed uh, animals that howl a lot. And it's important for the rest you'll, of the talk. You'll get it. <laughs> so let's talk about Data Hub. Uh, you've heard a lot about it. Uh, a lot of people think that it's a place to go find data and discover data. Uh, and really, the simplest way to think about Data Hub is that it's the number one open source metadata platform for the modern data stack. And if you look at our integrations, you'll probably see every single modern data stack tool up there. In fact, in a lot of cases, there are some legacy tools up there and some postmodern tools as well, because Data is messy, and a lot of people have to integrate with a lot of things. The other thing that we're very proud about is uh, the number of companies that are uh, adopting Data Hub. Obviously, it started out at LinkedIn a bunch of years ago, but now it's in broad use at companies uh, in the consumer space, like Expedia and Peloton, but also in kind of the more serious enterprise space, like Optum and Saxo Bank. Um, and we're seeing a lot of uh, folks like Udemy also getting deep into it with uh, advanced data ops use cases. So we're really excited to see you know, the breadth of use cases that Data Hub is able to solve for different verticals and different industries. There are too many companies, and I'm really sorry if we left you out of this slide. Um, the full list is available on the Data Hub project uh, website. Yeah, and so um, let's talk about our community for a second. Um, over the past year, we've grown 10 times our Slack community. Uh, we actually just reached over 2,700 people, so this is even out of date uh, just from yesterday. Um, when, so when someone joins the Data Hub community, I send a, a DM just to introduce myself, help people get kind of settled in. Also ask them, you know, what brought you here? And, you know, what are you excited about? Um, and so really what we find is that the, uh, a good portion of community members are data engineers, uh, also software engineers. We have solution, arch uh, solution architects coming in, um, as well as, uh, Oh, sorry, systems are six system architects, excuse me. Um, and we're also starting to see more PMs come in, data uh, scientists come in, so we're you know, kind of rounding out the uh, variety of personas that are, are coming in here. We are truly a global community. Our Slack community is active at all hours of the day, uh, which I should probably turn off my phone from time to time, but not today. Um, and then in terms of our contributions, we in the past 12 months had 97 distinct uh, contributors. Just in the last month alone, we had 42 in a single month. And I think about half of those were actually first time contributors. So it's a combination of folks who have you know, been around for a while contributing to the project, but also people that are coming in or, and are excited to contribute to it there. One of the recent things that happened that uh, Maggie is very excited about is that uh, on, our, on our latest uh, monthly town hall, so we do a town hall every month, uh, and on the latest, uh, well, the one before this, on February, I think, yeah. uh, we broke the internet, or rather we broke Zoom, because we had what we thought was a pretty expensive uh, Zoom subscription, uh, but turns out it wasn't enough, because more than 100 people showed up for a monthly town hall, and they were harassing, like, they were asking us on Slack, <laughs> that there's too many people on the Zoom. Can you please kick some of them out? Yeah. <laughs> and so now we're, we have a more expensive Zoom subscription. So congrats, Zoom. Nice growing uh, pains to deal with, yeah. All right, so, but we're here to talk about data discovery. And Data Hub is an important part of it. But as an industry, you know, this term data discovery 
has been around for a while. Um, in fact, I was doing a little Google search earlier this morning to see when is the first occurrence of Data Council and Data Discovery together. It turns out in um, 2018 uh, was the first time uh, there was a talk uh, done about data discovery. Uh, it was a team that had obviously solved the problem, uh, and they presented it at Data Council. But then when we talk to the community that still continues to pour into the Data Hub uh, Slack channel and we ask them what's not working, clearly a lot of things still are not working with data discovery, which is why people are still kind of coming in and trying to find solutions to their problems. Uh, so we are here, unfortunately, as Lemony Snicket says, not to give you good news, uh, but to give you some bad news. We actually need to rethink data discovery. Uh, a lot of the ways in which we've been doing data discovery aren't quite uh, working out. But there's hope, there's hope. Um, we obviously talked to a bunch of companies, and Maggie has been doing uh, a lot of uh, interviews, and she came up with this idea to create a fictional company. So tell us all about yeah, it. Yeah, so given um, my obsession with dogs and animals in general, and me forcing that on the rest of the team, we created a fictional company called Longtail Companions, where every pet is exceptional. Um, so we're gonna go through, we're gonna use this as kind of a use case, and go through kind of their evolution of their tech stack and the discovery problems that came along the way. Um, but one thing I will call out is that this is really compiled and representative of the outcomes of conversations I've had with literally hundreds of community members about you know, what their tech stack is, the problems they're facing, why they showed up in the first place. So um, Longtail Companions set out to adopt, or match every pet with every human across the nation. So first they started with an adoptions team, and their focus was really to do just that. Find a pet, find a human, match them up together. And they hired a few engineers uh, to build that product. And the engineers basically said, well, we've got to store you know, uh, they, you know, information about a pet, and we have to store um, kind of when uh, someone signs in, match them up with the pet, and then finally when an adoption happens, we need to record the fact that this pet was adopted by this person. And they picked you know, familiar tools from the stack, uh, Postgres for storing kind of the more uh, authoritative source of truth data for an adoption actually happening. And MongoDB is kind of a flexible document-oriented store because you know, pets need profiles and humans need profiles. And they weren't quite sure what the schema of these things would look like, so they kind of went flexible and said, well, JSON works. So that's how they built out a very quick uh, adoptions app and it worked well. Yeah, and the adoptions team, just the, the adoption program just exploded. It was fantastic. But then they realized, oh my gosh, we need leashes and dog food and cat food. And so they spun up an e-commerce team to provide a supplement to the uh, very successful adoption program. And of course, the e-commerce team uh, said, well, we need a place to store purchases that are happening and you know, record every single transaction as it happens. And of course, Postgres works. We have a team that knows how to operate and run it, and so they chose Postgres for that table or the set of tables. But they also realized that they were bringing up an app and a website, and people are gonna be clicking around, and they're gonna be searching for stuff, and then uh, you know, we wanna recommend maybe items that are better than others, because people who like Labradoodles typically buy these kind of bows, things like that. Tim. And so they said, well, we need an event stream. And so they heard about this amazing technology called Kafka that makes event streaming very easy to use. And they adopted Kafka as their event streaming platform. So the e-commerce team has got Postgres and Kafka, and the adoption team has uh, Postgres and Mongo. And, and life then, is good, right? Yeah, it's pretty good. And then they realized, OK, we're hitting some scale issues with our, the data that we have. So let's bring on a data platform team. That focus will be on landing data in a central lake and making it more actionable. And the data platform team looked around, found a few operators they could get from Airflow to take data from Kafka and land it into the lake, a few more operators to take data from Postgres, land it into the lake, and they did it. And, they and did it was it. working and mostly. Everybody was happy. <laughs> and then they hired, they realized that, okay, now the data's in our, uh, in our warehouse, we actually need some people who know what to do with that, right? So they hire out an analytics engineering team, who of course is adopting all the kind of modern best practices of DBT for transformations, great expectations for validation, and then looker for a presentation layer. So hopefully this is a common kind of paradigm, something that you can maybe kind of like feel uh, related to a little bit. And it worked, you know, everyone was making the best decisions for their own, uh, their own use cases. But at the end of the day, we actually saw that 
the long tailers still had a bunch of questions that popped up. So for example, on the adoptions team, they would ask, what happens if I, if I need to make a change or a breaking change to, this, uh, to the pet profile table? What's going to break downstream? And it was a really hard thing to figure out because everything was so siloed and fragmented. So they'd drop a column, cross, or cross their fingers, close their eyes, and just pray that nothing fell apart from there. And the e-commerce team also had a data science team. And the data science team was busy building models and training them and shipping products to the site that could actually lift CTR or enable better conversion from an item being shown to actually being purchased. And one of the things that the long tail founders um, really were serious about is not mixing adoptions data with e-commerce data because there was a commitment that they had to the community that when you as a human come in and adopt a pet, we're not gonna sell stuff to you if you didn't actually give us consent to use your data. And so the e-commerce team was always nervous about, are we using data in the right way? Are we incorrectly mixing in adoptions data from the adoptions team's data sets, maybe a derived data set? And they were always nervous about releasing a model, especially a model that was doing too well, because they were like, maybe, maybe there's some personalized data in there, and that's why this model is doing well. Yeah. But they didn't know how to solve that problem. And then we move on to the data engineering team. Well, the data engineering team is my past life, and um, these teams uh, end up being the responsible team for producing a data set or a set of data that the rest of the company can really reliably rely on. And that ends up being pipelines have to be running on time and have to land data accurately every single day. And if you're doing hourly pipelines, they have to land every single hour. And the thing that they were nervous about was by the time they noticed problems, it was too late. Uh, when they tried out data discovery solutions, you know, things were just never fresh and things were never accurate. And so they were really running um, around headless chickens, maybe is a yeah. reasonable uh, analogy here, uh, to figure out why is the data broken, which data sets to worry about, and whether a particular data set is actually ready to be consumed by a downstream team. And we're not talking humans here, we're talking pipelines and programs which means there are trains running on a schedule and there's no person kind of saying now is a good time to go. So it really has to be low latency and drive kind of that automated action. And then of course our analytics engineering team, they're on a tight de deadline, they need to build something out like yesterday, and they want to understand what's the authoritative pet data set. I look in our, our uh, data warehouse and our data lake, there's hundreds and thousands and thousands of assets. I have no idea what to trust. Um, and so it just becomes kind of like a, like this one is very near and dear to my heart where it's just a lot of time and energy spent just trying to figure out what is safe and reliable for me to use. And then finally, they're the execs. You know, every company needs one or a few of them. Um, sometimes they're pointy haired and sometimes they don't have any hair, uh, but they all have the same worries and the same problems. Uh, are we, you know, they, they quickly bought a bunch of uh, SaaS tools um, and then started shipping data up there. Uh, you know, Marketo, MailChimp, there's a bunch of uh, SaaS tools that really enable you to get productive very quickly. And they're just always worried. Are we sharing PII data up in there um, and not managing our data responsibly? Uh, how much, you know, data leakage do we have if something upstream uh, wants to do an opt-out? Am I actually respecting it end-to-end? And then um, last but not least, we have our, our beloved business stakeholders whom without we would not have jobs because we are building resources to support them. And they come in and say, wait a minute, this return rate calculated over here is different from that one. Why is it different? I'm losing trust in the data. So how do we go about actually you know, building out um, or providing a additional context and additional resources um, to instill that trust and you know, help people actually make decisions off of this data? So again, these are just the questions that would come up again and again with the, uh, the long tailors. And this is due to a very common and typical data uh, catalog story. Yeah, and this, the words data discovery, data catalog, they're often used interchangeably and we'll use them the same way. But a typical data catalog story that we've seen play out time and time again in different companies at different stages of adoption is um, the data catalog gets installed. Um, it's typically architected to connect up to every single source of data and metadata that there is. It starts crawling it, pulling all of this into a central place. And then there's a web app on top of it. Um, and data consumers go in there and start adding documentation, knowledge, tagging people, uh, tagging data sets, and hoping that things are going to get better. 
But what tends to happen is what we're finding is it just doesn't work. After that first excitement of installing this thing and bringing it on board and integrating everything, all of which are really valiant efforts and worthwhile, the catalog or the data discovery solution starts becoming stale. People start losing trust in it because the real action is somewhere else. It's happening every single time someone edits a DBT model, every single time someone goes and creates a new Looker dashboard, every single time someone changes a schema on an online Postgres table. And a lot of that isn't getting captured here. And so this becomes yet another tool in maybe the common data stack uh, that you have in your ecosystem, and it's now yet another source of problems. Yeah, so, so why is this happening? Yeah, let's dig into some of the issues that come along with that. So um, first and foremost, physical metadata, if you start with that and, and are tro like focused solely on representing the physical structure of data, that's not intuitive or easy to understand for a wide set of stakeholders. So it solves a very narrow set of problems. And then a few other things that show up is um, a lot of catalogs are reliant only on crawl-based ingestion, which means they are going to connect up to the source of metadata and then pull it down. And this is good to get started, but it's not good forever because things are changing all the time. And by the time you actually find that something has changed from you, it's too late. The second thing that goes along with this being able to observe changes in real time is being able to act on those changes in real time. Even as we are giving this talk, a few Airflow pipelines probably finished running, and a few of them probably ran successfully, and a few of them probably failed. Someone probably checked in a backwards and compatible schema change while this talk was going on. And if you don't know about it now, you cannot prevent bad things from happening now. You only prevent bad things from happening tomorrow or maybe next week, and by that time, the damage is done. Yeah, and then um, another big problem here is uh, an, an overemphasis on manual enrichment or kind of like post hoc enrichment. So you slurp up all this metadata, then a human goes in and kind of annotates or, or cleans it up. But then if you don't maintain that, it's immediately stale. I can't tell you how many times I personally have done this myself, thinking this, now that, now that I've created this Google Sheet, this will be where we are maintaining all of our definitions for the rest of time, and it's stale the next day. Um, so an over-reliance on, on kind of like the manual uh, side of enrichment, enrichment is a huge, huge, huge problem with a typical approach. And then finally, a lot of data catalogs only focus on the data warehouse. Um, yesterday, I was up on stage here talking about the definition of a data set. And a lot of us agreed that data sets don't live and die in the data warehouse. They actually begin their life all the way on the left, where your production systems are running and creating new tables, new Kafka topics, name it. And then they get transformed in the streaming data ecosystem, and then they come to the warehouse, and then they get transformed a bunch more, and then they leave the data warehouse and go into your third-party systems. And so if you just focus all your attention on the data warehouse, it's important, but it's not telling you the full story. And that leads to kind of these end-to-end -end use cases not working out. Yeah, so we've told you a common story, something that should be familiar with you. We've told you all of the ways that there are big problems with it. So what are we proposing? If there are three things that we want you to walk away from in, uh, in this talk, it's Metadata 360. Oop, there we go. Uh, streaming metadata and shift left. So these are all very buzzwordy, but we're gonna go through these one by one and start breaking it down a little bit. So what does this look like in practice? Um, we're gonna start with Metadata 360, and before we go into the, the kind of demo there, just wanna talk through this a little bit. This is saying that metadata is, it requires a holistic view of what's going on, going on across systems and across the business. So it's not just your technical metadata, it's not just your business definition, it's tying all of those pieces together for a very um, kind of like cohesive story of, of what it represents. Um, so this is a view, if we're looking at this use case, of um, how is return rate calculated. This is going into Data Hub and we're gonna search for return rate. And then what we see is there's actually two uh, terms here. And maybe I'm not actually familiar with those, so I'm gonna go to a dashboard that I know and love, the Available Pets dashboard. And immediately I can see that this dashboard is assigned or associated with this return rate. And in here what I now see is a plain language definition of what it represents and also the SQL logic that, that composes it. 
I also have quick access to see who owns it, so I can uh, reach out to ask questions if I need to, but it's really just pulling everything together in a single plane. So I know that was a very quick little recording, so let's actually look at this a little bit closer. So for folks that are using dbt, a common way of documenting assets is by using the docs macro. So what we can do on the left is specify that next to the analytics, like within the analytics engineering code. So as, as these terms evolve, as these definitions evolve, it's right next to where those folks are actually working. It's not in a Google Sheet, it's not in Confluence or a wiki page or whatever, it's right where you're working. So once we've checked this in on the left, we can now automatically slurp that up into Data Hub and present it within that uh, kind of like holistic picture. So as things evolve, it's evolving within the code and we're representing that within the UI. Um, so on the same th uh, in the same vein of physical and business metadata, it's starting to ask the question of what's the authoritative data set? And let's be real, like, None of us in this room have a definition of what un unauthoritative anything should be within data. It's all about context and understanding how it's used, how it's produced, and um, you know, kind of like the operational metrics along with it. So if I want to understand the authoritative pet data set, I can either go into the main browse page and start to browse by uh, data asset type or across all of my uh, platforms, or I can just go into the unified search experience and type pet. So automatically I have a faceted experience where I can start to filter down by either type, so data set or chart or uh, dashboard, whatever you want. By platform, I can also look by domain, so for your data mesh folks in there, we can search by that. Um, but here I know that I just care about a Snowflake data set and I wanna find the right pet one, right? So I see pet details, but here's pet profiles. This one looks pretty promising. So what I see in here is the column table uh, schema definition. I have access to recent and top queries that have been executed, so I can contextualize how this is being used within the organization. Um, I can also look at data profiling stats to understand the shape of data as it is today. I can also look at it as it was yesterday, two days ago, three months ago, and understand how that has evolved over time. Um, so we have it both at the table level, we also have it at the column level, so you can see what the distribution of null percentage is or distinct percentage, et cetera. And then the other thing is, again, tying it back to these owners and domains, and now I see that this pet adoption um, is part of this business critical core pet adoption uh, domain. So this gives me a ton of indicators that this is a really good place for me to start, and not all of the other 1,700,000 000,000 pet related data assets that we have within our stack. So if we... Okay, let's dig in, just wanna do like a little zoom in because I know that was a quick demo. So this is our uh, data profiling page. My guess is it's a little bit hard for folks to read in the past, or uh, sorry, in the back. Um, but really what we're showing is just a high level uh, snapshot of what the shape of this data looks like. I know that when I do data discovery, the first thing I'm doing is looking at row counts, volume, distribution of columns, we have that here for you. And then we can also transverse that over time to see how it's evolved. The next part, again, is just a top query, so it's contextualizing how this data set is used within your organization, just kind of further bolstering your understanding or your confidence. And then, super exciting, we just rolled this out uh, within the last month or so. We're now um, integrated with great expectations and additional uh, data validation uh, plugins to come. But you can see all, if you're, if you're working with great expectations, you can see the validation outcomes. Uh, you can kind of double click into it to understand what failed, what happened, what the actual outcomes were there. So again, this is truly like a 360 view of how this is used within a company, how it's used with other data sets, plain language definitions, and then tags out to um, relevant, uh, relevant terms or uh, domains. The thing I like about this uh, is how Business metadata, which is traditionally represented using glossary terms and um, you know, taxonomies, uh, are being connected up to the physical metadata, which is you know, tables and columns and all of the operational metadata that's uh, being emitted by things that are running. For example, one of the things that you might have noticed or not are that airflow pipelines and tasks are part of that search experience. And as we go into kind of lineage demos of Data Hub, uh, you'll be able to see that they actually show up in the end-to-end -end lineage. Yeah. Um, so first we talked about Metadata 360, now we're gonna talk about shift-left. Um, what does that mean? Shift-left is basically saying, in an end-to-end -end pipeline, 
shift your focus on documentation and enriching with um, robust metadata by, um, by extracting that from the source code. So don't annotate at the end, shift it all the way to the beginning and, and extract as much as you possibly can from there. So um, with the question of what happens if I, if I push a breaking change to this data set, um, I know personally I have merged many breaking changes and have just prayed to the gods and it has always backfired. So um, one thing we can do here is our uh, impact analysis whereby because we have extracted all of this rich metadata from the source code, we're able to stitch everything together within a lineage graph. And in here I'm looking for pet profiles. I'm looking at the source code, so MongoDB. And I see that, yep, okay, this is exactly what I'm looking for. This is, uh, you know, has the tags I'm looking for. It's owned by my team, and I'm ready to see what the impact will be. So if we look at just this quick lineage view, it just shows one DAG downstream. Seems like very, not that big of a deal, right? But if we go into our impact analysis, we start to see that there are literally hundreds of entities that are potentially impacted by this. And then we can start to slice and dice and, and start to better understand what that, those would be. Um, so that same kind of faceted search experience. So then if we look at data sets, maybe I want to like a sanity check to make sure that, okay, this is something that I'm familiar with or I want to understand what it is. We have an in-context way to view that entity in its own context, right? So now I see this beautiful dog, Zara, is still up for adoption. Someone adopt this dog, please. What are we doing? And I don't want to break something that would sabotage that, right? So I go into the impact analysis again, and I can um, actually start to export all of this information so I know exactly who to talk to. Um, by downloading the CSV, we get the full set of impacted entities. And you'll see that um, you know, we have information about who owns it, their email address so I can reach out to them directly. We have information about the tags or terms or, or data domains that they're a part of. Um, and it really allows us to be much more proactive about pushing out these changes and not just simply praying to the data gods and hoping for the best. So one thing that Maggie hopefully convinced you about is shifting left in terms of moving your focus, not just on the data warehouse, but actually moving your gaze leftwards into production systems and being able to understand left to right what is the impact of something that changed. The other thing that we're really excited about is representing metadata as code. And what does that mean? It means applying usual software engineering practices to data logic as well as metadata. What that looks like in practice, especially for long tailors, is being able to met, uh, version their schemas as well as the metadata attached to those schemas as code. So uh, quick body count again. How many of you have actually worked with Kafka in your current job or previous jobs? All right, cool. So this will probably look familiar to you. Um, Kafka, usually people use it with schemas for the topics. Uh, data sets in Kafka are topics. They are streams of events that are continuously changing. And usually you attach schemas to these topics. And those schemas could be written in either Avro or Protobuf or JSON schema. And please tell me you're not using the bytes option, which is an option, but please don't use it. So once you decide to use a schema language, and in this case, you know, long tailors were ex-Google, so they like Protobuf. Um, they decided to use Protobuf. And this is what you know, the, the structure of the e-commerce uh, Kafka schema registry as checked into code looks like. Uh, the, you know, there's a top level directory, um, there's a common area for storing you know, common objects, and then the e-commerce team has their own kind of area for their topics that they maintain. We've got three up here. There's a click event when you click on an item. Uh, there's an impression event when you see an event, uh, see an item. And then there's a search event. This is when a search is rendered. So let's look at uh, what these events look like. Uh, seem, should seem, again, very familiar to people who are living and breathing protobuf, but for people who are new to it, I'll do a quick gentle introduction. On the right is the top level event, search event. It's basically um, a structured uh, record which has an event context, which is over here on the left. It's kind of a common header that all events should have, you know, things like the device ID, uh, the device type, user ID, IP address, timestamp, things like that. You want that on all your events, so you create a header and you include that in each of your events. And then the search event obviously has a few more elements like um, the list of results of the search uh, and a few other things. But in addition to just that structure, you'll see something interesting in this protobuf definition. 
There are a couple of additional annotations that have been added in, uh, which are marked as options. So you'll see a classification option that's been added called classification.sensitive, and you'll see uh, an option for a team which says e-commerce. Uh, over to the left, on the event context uh, common struct, you'll see another option on the IP address field saying that the classification for that field is classification.sensitive. Now what, and this is actually a contribution from David, who works at Zendesk and contributed this amazing feature into Data Hub, is the ability for there to be schema annotations living side by side with protobuf schemas. And these allow you to put business context and business metadata in line with your schemas. And now you can imagine uh, you can have schema linters that validate that all of your stuff actually has annotations if you want it to. And more importantly, every time one of these schemas gets checked in and deployed, your CI CD system, whether you're using Travis or GitHub Actions or whatever, can actually build and push these metadata artifacts to Data Hub. And that's where kind of Data Hub's architecture shines. I'll go into that later. But coming back to what this looks like on the UI, you go and search for the search event, and what you will find is individual elements from those schemas have been directly mapped into tags or terms or documentation, which means there's no more of this, something got checked in, now we have to go to the UI and fix it up. You're basically shifting left all of your metadata acquisition activities so that you can catch bad metadata before it makes it into your data ecosystem. Yeah, and for um, folks that are using DBT, we have this exact same functionality in place for, um, for assigning meta components. So if you are classifying your, your models that way, if you're assigning ownership that way, we actually just automatically map that for you back to kind of like the UI. So again, it's maintaining all of those things in code and not having to do it post hoc. Um, quick time check, Shoshanka. Yep. We have about 10 minutes, I think. Sounds good. Um, so we are going to zoom through the rest of this. So we've talked about two things so far. Um, metadata 360, shift left, and now we're gonna talk about streaming metadata. All right, so you've heard this multiple times. Your data is changing all the time, and as is your metadata, which means if you want to solve questions like, is this data set reliable? Can I use it right now? And if you're a program that's about to kick off, it's really important for you to have metadata at your fingertips that is live and trustworthy. And what we observe time and time again is that just having Metadata 360 and just having shift left principles is not enough. You actually need a platform that can keep up with the volume and velocity of changes that are happening in your data fabric. Because this is not just a schema changed, it's actually a lot of volume of operational metadata that you need to be able to handle. So I'll zoom through really quick um, through the Data Hub architecture. This actually is a one hour talk by itself. Catch us in office hours and we'll geek out about graph databases and key value stores and change data capture. It's a lot of fun. And this was my past life. Um, I've written a blog about it. Feel free to check it out. There are really three generations of architectures when it comes to architecting data catalogs or metadata systems. Generation one was the whole crawl-based systems. They connect up to systems, bring it in, monolithic web app, inflexible, opinionated data model, um, works to an extent, doesn't work forever. The second generation was kind of elevating the service aspect of it, still inflexible, but at least now you can write to the metadata store and it's not just crawling stuff. So an improvement, but still suffers from a lot of problems uh, because of the monolithicity of it. The third generation, which is where Data Hub really is, uh, believes in a loosely coupled stream-oriented architecture. What that allows you to do is move metadata acquisition and metadata production where it's happening and allows you to actually integrate your entire common stack ecosystem into a single aggregated data fabric. Um, in practice, this is what it looks like. The architecture allows you to have all your data sources up into the left, producing metadata at whatever volume they want. It can be either crawled in or pushed, and we don't distinguish between the two. All of this metadata gets into the central metadata storage and the graph and powers uh, both front-end experiences, the app, a lot of the demos that you saw today, as well as programmatic use cases. Maybe a compliance job kicks off. Uh, wants to fetch compliance metadata before it goes and cleans data up. 
Maybe there's an ML feature store that wants to fetch in additional metadata about a feature before it starts serving. Uh, and then for stream integrations, you can actually subscribe to changes that are happening to your metadata in real time. The storage architecture is polyglot uh, and, and, and poly index. Uh, we support key value stores as the primary source of truth, typically MySQL. There's a Kafka log that comes out, which is a change, of, uh, a change log or a commit log of events that have happened to the metadata stream, which feeds uh, internal indexes, like the search index, the graph index, as well as a time series index as well as external um, uh, integrations, such as anything that wants to listen and subscribe to the list of changes that are happening. So end-to-end, -end, the streaming metadata platform really enables what we consider the control plane for data. On your left, you've got all of these different systems that are producing and making changes to your data ecosystem. An Airflow job running, a Spark job running, a schema getting checked in, um, a table getting created, all of this stuff produces changes. Data Hub's job is to observe all of these changes, store it responsibly in the largest metadata graph we can get, version every single change, allow refining these changes. There's a lot of entity resolution that you have to do to actually standardize some of this metadata across these systems, and then allow you to query the metadata at rest. So you can do version queries, or you can do point in time queries, as well as react to these changes that are happening. And so the potential, obviously, is enormous uh, in terms of what you can do when you can subscribe to changes. Uh, you can fire off a Slack alert. You can uh, fire off a Jira ticket. You can maybe even fire off a great expectations run to validate the data that just landed. Uh, the possibilities are endless, and we're just getting started. And we think this is going to unleash a new set of use cases on top of the metadata fabric. So we started with the talk with talking about discovery. And where we landed is kind of active metadata management which is what streaming really enables. You can do things like tag propagation, impact analysis, versioned uh, lookbacks into your history of data and metadata. And here's a quick um, demo of what time travel for schema history looks like uh, on the Data Hub uh, backend. So this is basically a CLI experience. Whoa, how do I play the video? Or maybe it is. All right, so that's the CLI. And um, so you're on the console, you've got the Data Hub CLI, and you can basically ask questions about any data set and ask for changes that have happened to its technical schema or to its tags or any kind of business uh, change that has happened to the definition of the entity. And what you get back is kind of a versioned timeline of changes that have happened to it. Think of it almost like a Facebook feed for what happened to this entity, but really uh, a log of changes that have happened to it. But you can think of it more as um, important changes being highlighted in red. For example, as you see here, uh, a backwards incompatible change was made. Uh, a particular column got deleted. So despite all of the impact analysis work that that team had done, they, they removed a column. And you can kind of see it. And you see the uh, versions go up. Which means, as a, as a programmatic interface, you can actually depend and halt downstream pipelines if a backwards incompatible change has been detected in a schema. The second thing that is also very interesting is you can do tag propagation with a system like this. So on the very left, you've got a MySQL table, and then you've got a Kafka topic. That's the CDC for it. And then finally, a BigQuery a data set. We can go into the MySQL table, add a particular classification tag to it. And as soon as we add it in, because of the policy set by the administrator, the tag can actually propagate down to the Kafka data set and then propagate down to the BigQuery data set. What this means is you, as a human, don't have to repeat yourself. You don't have to go from data set to data set to data set and annotate each one of them manually by hand. You can annotate at source, and things will just automatically get taken care of you in real time. And the possibilities for these are endless. You can build access control systems. You can stop bad data in its track. And you can enable good data to actually flow to end systems without getting blocked by human processes. So we're back to the uh, important and one and only slide that you should remember from this talk. Take it away. Yeah, so um, 
if you want to go through the three of them. So just remember, Metadata 360, shift left, streaming metadata. Those are the three things that we want you to walk away from. Um, we are so happy to have been here. We are so happy to have met all of you. Please join our Slack community, join our metadata movement. Um, these are some ways that you can get in touch, to, or get in touch with us. Thank you.